Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and Twitch chat. Welcome to the Asus ROG Season 3 Dream League. My name's Odie Pixel. I'm here with Draskal, and today we've got two best of three series for you, with the first one kicking off right now with Basically Unknown up against the side of Eternal Envy's Disciples in the final semi-final before the final final, which will be after this one. What are we seeing so far? We're into the draft, so let's get ourselves into the picks and bans so you can catch up with what you've missed out on so far. And Basically Unknown, straight in there with the Magnus pick, Andy. I kind of figured that was going to be the case. As I imagined, uh, E's Disciples didn't first phase ban it. If you were going to let it go through second, then you probably would take it out. But they ban Wisp, which I was kind of expecting. Troll ban is Chalk, so is the Sniper. The Zeus is something that basically unknown, I think, specifically ban if they feel like they're going to get Magnus, just because of how annoying that hero can be against any type of blink initiator. So they get their melee core, they get their Magnus. This is with, fully within their comfort zone. What we've seen so far so i think they're quite pleased with themselves and ee's disciples they get their hands on shadow fiend and venge which is a very strong pairing in of itself and it does lend you a lot of uh, team fight potential too i just like the juggernaut pick like that matchup versus shadow fiend is really strong because you never really have to fight the shadow fiend if you have omni up for example you can just go in throw out an omni slash hope that you get a kill or two and then by the time you're out of it the requiem has probably already been cast and if not you can just spin and then you don't really take any damage. So it's not one of those cores like Void who has to go for BKB in order to be safe from that big Requiem damage. You still get the damage reduction, yes, which is still yeah, kind of annoying, sure. but it's not so bad to where you have to say, oh, well, I absolutely need BKB in this game because of this matchup. So I, I like the way that uh, basically no one have gone about this so far. Indeed, looking at the bans from E's Disciples, they ban out the Clockwork, a hero that we have seen. Of course, Mind Control play very, very well uh, in the previous uh, series that we saw Basically Unknown in. And they ban that. They also ban the Scarath out as well. We've kind of seen the Scarath uh, picked up a lot Ten with the Clockwork. Seconds. Do you feel that was a necessary ban when Clockwork wasn't going to be available for BU? It's necessary because Basically Unknown runs Skyrath a heck of a lot, and you can see it in their most pick right now on the little stat screen in the bottom right. So. Whenever they pick the Void or whenever they pick Magnus, they always pick a high damage dealing support to pair with it to make sure that you can utilize the ultimates that you do have. So whenever yeah. you have these early blink buyers like Magnus or Axe, for example, Clockwork is another great pairing like you had mentioned. Skyrath synergizes with them so well that normally you would need maybe two or three people to get a kill because RP doesn't really deal a substantial amount of DPS. But if you have that supplemental damage with a Skyrath, who is probably the single-handed highest damage dealing support, you just get it, you know. And here we go. Here they we really go, are indeed. going full Cloud9 right now. They really are. They're channeling yeah. their inner EE Sama. Drow Ranger picked up with the Venge and the SF. The question is, are they going to run the Visage as well? Basically unknown. It's kind of clear that they're still trying to work out what EE's Disciple is going to do with the Sladar ban. Sladar, a hero that we don't really expect to see a lot of the time, but a hero that would have been quite nice with the Venge and the Shadow Fiend, I suppose. Mass Minus Armor is a cool strategy. Presence of the Dark Lord plus Amp means that killing Roshan, whenever you get the opportunity, he just drops. Yeah. You know, you can't really deal with that kind of damage. But what they're doing is setting up the, themselves for a very strong laning phase, which I love, because I think that's the best style to play against what basically I don't have. You just snowball your lane super hard, you got Radiant side, you'll be able to play it really greedy with your Shadow Fiend for a little while. And then once you have your core items up, these Drow Ranger compositions are supposed to win mid to mid late game. And then if you go ultra late, Drow becomes kind of mediocre of a hero and fighting into basically unknown, having already the Ogre Magi with the Bloodlust and an Empowered Juggernaut, the ultra late is already going to favor them pretty heavily just because of the team fight utility that a Magnus can bring and how scary a Juggernaut can be if you get a good Omni off during an engagement. So E's Disciples, I think, already kind of have some pressure on them to make sure that their lanes go well yeah. and they can have a big enough lead to where basically unknown can't just defend high ground once and just come back, but it could always end up being the case. Okay, and yeah. now was good. this is kind of adding yes. to what I was anticipating. Will they run this aggressively, the Drow, Venge, and Undying against the Juggernaut? They could, very yeah. easily. And Undying is pretty terrifying for these melee compositions. If you look at all their heroes, they have no way to clear zombies right now, and they don't even have a good tombstone killer per se. Now, if the Juggernaut has like yeah. Mask of Madness or something, you can just chop it a few times, but that's still damage that you're not dealing to heroes, and you're still standing there. You have potentially like three man decays coming out, then Undying is going to be huge. Mm -hmm. So I actually think that uh, EE's Disciples draft right now is pretty solid, and their game plan is very clear. Like, there's no question about it. They want to do well in the lanes. They want to snowball, and they want to end the game. I mean, do you think when you're kind of coming from the back foot, you're a team that's maybe not at the same level as someone that's established like BU, is that the best thing to do, to try and avoid taking it to the late game and making sure that you can get it done quicker? 
Taking it to the late game is scary yeah. because one mistake can be the end of the game. You know, you go in, you have one bad team fight. Maybe somebody doesn't quite have enough money for buyback or you lose a Roshan because you timed your team fight poorly and that can be it. There's no coming back. So trying to win the game earlier, in my opinion, is always better because the mistakes don't add up as quickly. Whereas if you're 60 minutes in, you die once, all of a sudden you have to spend like 3,000 gold in a buyback and the net worth swings become pretty ridiculous at that point. So yes, I, I do think that early game is better. All right, and now as the side of BU, uh, you kind of realize that EU's disciples are going to go for this strategy and are going to look to push and end it quickly. What kind of picks would you expect to see them pick up? So they pick up the Queen of Pain. Yep. I guess that is going to be their solo laner, their off laner. Uh, that uh, very well. Do you think they're anticipating that it is an aggressive tri lane and they're just trying to pick a strong solo laner to go against the solo safe laner of EU's disciples? It could be that, or they could just be wanting to put the queen against the tri lane to ensure that the hero doesn't yeah. die to whatever is against it. Because yeah. I think getting the juggernaut farm is more important than um, the queen, remaining. for example, having a rough lane, because queen has ridiculous range. And I don't think that that tri lane of Venge, Drow, and Undying could kill a queen at all, unless there was like some terrible mistake that he had made at some point. So basically, Unknown's lanes are, are pretty weak, like aside from the queen pick, of course. but. Magnus, he's okay in lane, and it's only going to do well because Arise is playing it. Yes. And then yeah. Juggernaut is still an okay laner, but against what EU's Disciples have, they have no gap closer right now. Like, who's supposed to initiate before this Magnus has his Blink Dagger? Queen does not want to blink in against that team, because you just eat one stun, you get like double raise, you get silenced, and you just die. So I'm feeling, um, I'm feeling basically unknown want to try to delay the game until they have their core items up and then only look to take a few engagements if they feel very confident in their positioning in the game. And going later again, I still think it's okay. Yeah. It's still risky no matter what composition you have because of what we talked about earlier, but I think their lineup works better later than it does in the early game. Okay, and the final pick is going to be the Puck, so this almost certainly will be their solo laner. Um, Pucking the solo safe lane against perhaps an aggressive tri lane, I mean, where's going to be the best position ideally for the Puck? Who are they trying to match the Puck up with? They want the Puck to be probably against... Well, they want the tri lane to be versus the tri lane of Bird okay. United, if, yeah. if it ends up yeah. being that. So you do want the Drow against the Juggernaut almost in every single case, if you're EE's Disciples. And a 1v1 Queen versus Puck is a relatively even matchup, maybe a tiny bit favored for the Queen, okay. because of the buffs that she has received so far. And her base damage, I believe, is a tiny bit higher, but you can outplay the matchup. That's really what it boils down to. So the better player will usually win. Um, but basically, I know I'm looking at probably another support right now. They don't really have a whole lot of options in terms of just being able to win their lanes. Maybe they decide to go a bit greedy and pick up a hero who might be able to uh, to jungle or something like that. Because at this point, picking anything, if they get aggro tried into their Juggernaut, mm -hmm. they're not going to be able to win their lanes no matter what they pick. Like, there's just, I cannot see that lane dying. But okay, they're going to go with an AA. And that's very strong for deep push, which I think is the main reason why they picked it. You throw an Ice Blast out onto the team who's going to be going probably early mech on Teddy, who's going to be taking up that Shadow Fiend. And you can stop a push just by spam. Yeah. So you have like a queen who can go for a quick agonims. You have AA who can also help deep push. You have your shockwave spam. And that should be enough to deter E's disciples for a little while. They'll probably still get tier ones because tier ones are very hard to defend with what they have. But if the mag can get blink, they win a handful of team fights. I'd say basically an owner in great shape. But if E's disciples snowball off their laning phase, it's going to be really rough. Right, we'll see how well it uh, does end up going for his disciples. And yeah, I think, as you said, basically unknown with the whole kind of Magnus, Queen of Pain, AA combination, that is going to instantly blow up the side it's of Easty at any point. Yeah. Which is which is kind of what we see basically unknown go for every time they pick the Magnus. You know, they yeah. don't emphasize themselves early on. They just wait until they've got the ults online, and then they always seem to find the perfect fight, which really allows them to turn the game around and get themselves back into the game. And uh, talking about into the game, we are into the first game of this first best of three series today, and we're ready to go. It's EE's D up against the side of BU, basically unknown. On the side of the dire today, we're going to have pure evil on the AA. It's going to be the Russian dude, uh, maybe not Russian, maybe Ukrainian. It's, we're going to call him, what should we call him? Insulin. Tom, insulin. Yeah. Insulin with a silly, well, not silly name because because uh, Ru Russians aren't silly. But anyway, moving on from the Russian ogre, we've got uh, Vegeta Riser Rise himself on the Magnus. It's going to be Nico Baby on the Juggernaut, Pure Evil on the AA, Mind Control on the Queen of Pain, and Amodipex Lamo Draskal. And Draskal, what's on the Radiant? All right, so we're going to have uh, 
McGraw, the RNGs is down here playing on the Drow Ranger. Uh, okay, Sia is going to be playing the Vengeful Spirit. Towards top rune, we got Teddy on the Shadow Fiend, the big bad bird playing on Dying. And then finally, Talara, who's playing on Fuck. Okay, I mean, so Undying at the moment on the top lane, do you think they're going to leave it as dual lanes, or do you imagine they will leave the puck on it, right? They could leave it as dual lanes if they really wanted to. Undying is ridiculously powerful in the laning phase, and that opens up a lot of space for Talara to be able to find his farm. If you get a, a blink on that puck the in the early game, begins. you have great way to initiate. And plus, they have Drought Aura, so all of the cores that are going to be farming are affected by the Drought Aura in every single lane, which oh, is, oh no. Edgeful Spirit, oh. a lot of trouble. AA Chilling Touch level oh. one, what a spell, Draskal. AA Chilling Touch is one of the best tri-lane versus tri-lane abilities that you're going to have because <laughs> of the damage output. So being showcased right there, basically a known get on the board with a, a very quick first blood. And that's great for them. Like we were talking about, the EE's Disciples lineup, they want to win early game really, really hard. Like, that's the entire point of the draft and having a Drow with a Shadow Fiend farming mid and a Puck top. So they are going to rotate the Undying. They realize that they need to address the tri-lane of basically unknown. Okay, so yeah, leaving the Puck alone. And, and having the Puck alone in this lane, I mean, the Puck's no, not going to die necessarily, Wait, is it? back. Oh, okay. So you, I, you feel he would be a much better suited to joining them down bottom? It just depends on where the supports of basically unknown go. They just want to make sure that no lane is going to be heavily favored for basically unknown because they have the heroes to win every lane and that's what they've built for so if they can get that matchup then that's what they're going to be doing right, insulin coming in with the punches onto puck undying will waltz into lane and scare him off bottom lane the mind control chilling out in the trees has got a blink available but we'll get caught out by the stun we'll blink north that and that thir is a 1300 blink rage i yeah. believe but could be in trouble as they're going to try and wrap around she is salving up at the moment okay see so yeah, has he got enough mana for a second magic missile he has not he is still 10 mana short the punches will come through mind control has got another blink available so we'll be okay in the situation Still 1-0 to the side of basically unknown. And and in terms of the lanes overall now, looking at how they've settled out, who are you kind of favoring at this point? Still a USD? I think they'll probably win. They'll win bottom for sure. And then middle lane should go even, oh, which is yeah. fine, because Shadowfane can just eat the jungle if he ever needs to recover or gets ganked or something like that. And because the Undying and the Puck are top, that means when the supports leave, they're just going to be getting a ton out of this laning phase. So maybe a tiny bit favored for Ease Disciples, probably not as much as they oh. want to, but it'd be a kill. Lane. Tombstone going down, Illusory Old Forward trying to chase down the Ogre. Wolf a stun out to Talera, the stun connects, but not before he dies. Ogre Magi just uh, going a little bit too deep and a little bit too hard there. Unfortunate circumstances, the AA was checking the two minute rune, and that, that was just a little bit of miscommunication. When your secondary support leaves to go check a rune, and he had vision as well, like they have a ward there, so I don't know why he was even in that area to begin with when he saw that both of them were over there. Just a mistake coming out from basically unknown. But lanes considered, the Shadow Fiend is winning mid, which is expected because Shadow Fiend with Drow Aura is like impossible to beat. You just get free, what, like eight or nine damage after the first minute or so, and then you're able to snowball your lane off of that. But the Queen is doing way better than I expected, at least in terms of farm. She's eight and three. She's out farming the Drow, which okay. is <laughs> not something. ideal given the circumstances. I mean, how, why do you think that's happening? What's uh, the Venge, is the vet, is it up to the Venge really? Is, should he be doing better? It's only out, never mind though, because don't worry about the bottom lane going bad for the side of ESD, because top lane Boom. is going very, very well. Second kill there for the, uh, well, the Puck and Dying combination. And this is gonna mean that Tolera's gonna, if it goes like this, have a pretty good timing on the Blink Dagger. Now this lane is going extremely well. He could be dying here, no, no orb mana. Oh, he's coming up now. <laughs> he's out of there. Nicely Jaunts done. out. Ogre's not going to be able to find the stun. Pure Evil, though, coming in with a chilling touch with the three heroes. The Juggernaut chasing him down with a slow as well. It's not going to be enough to get the Undying either. So, I mean, yeah, this offlane dual lane working absolute wonders for ESD. That was very well played by Taller getting that clarity off because he was only a handful of mana short of throwing his orb out in the first place. And if they just keep doing one lanes, this is what their lineup is built for. They can hit their timing window. They can get Teddy with the mech. They can just start pushing into these tier ones. Maybe open up a early Roshan as well because of their damage output and having Venge minus armor on top of that. And they're going to be checking the rune here. Who gets there first? Looks like a rice. One dying could be in trouble. In comes the slow. They skewer forward as well to get the double slow. Tombstone will get thrown down. Big Bad Bird trying to stay alive with the decay. It won't be enough. He will get taken down, and Arise is going to be pretty happy with that. More money in his pocket, 1,100 gold in the bank so far, four minutes in. So we are seeing him en route to pretty much that eight, nine-minute blink dagger that we used to see him get. 
That's going to be the big game changer. Arise is the one that you always have to be aware of if you're playing against him, and he's not his best hero. His top lane could be seeing some initiation here, but I don't know if they're going to kill him. Stun comes out with the punches as well, bringing him low, but yeah, he's going to be able to join out safely. Indeed. And I mean, five minutes in, two for two. Looking at the CS still in the middle lane, it is, as you said, a lead for the Shadow Fiend, but Arise with the kill under his belt. They're pretty much going to be on plateau in terms of net worth. Bottom lane, the Queen of Pain has pretty much had the 8 CS earlier, and now she hasn't been able to He's find anymore. He's gotten Jack, yeah. Yeah, now, the, now she's getting zoned out. The first couple of waves were a little rough for them, but now that the Drow is starting to get some levels up, the damage difference becomes almost too much. And once he gets six, the damage that the, the offlane Puck is going to hit for is going to be insane. Like, he has plus 13 damage from the aura right now, and there's not even marksmanship up on McGraw yet. Once that kicks in, all these heroes are going to start hitting like trucks. And against nice. AA, we saw how quickly Pure Evil dropped to just a couple of right clicks and a decay. It's still very scary, I think, for basically a known's laning stage. They just really, really need a rise to have a good game. On the side of uh, basically unknown, bearing in mind the fact that in this safe lane tri lane, they have lost the supports a couple of times. Juggernaut's still farming really well. Um, yep. He's 34 CS. He's uh, top of the board for the team. So, you know, regardless of the fact that the lane as a whole is not going great, the Jug's still getting the farm. It is good too because the Jug matches up very well against a lot of the heroes from EU's Disciples, except for the Undying. He's the only one who I would not really like to be against, just because of Tombstone and such. It's just a, a really big hassle for the hero. And you don't you can't fight into it as him, even with Omni. And we're gonna see a loop around here. Oh, he's got a haste rune, he's got the RP as well. Big bad bird and Talera need to be careful. They're grouping up very, very closely. In comes the Mac. They're gonna split up now. Yeah, Undying realizes it's time to get out of there. Shockwave will connect. Ogre as well is here. They should be able to just run Undying down. They don't need to use the RP for this. They've screwed him backwards with the slow. He's decaying up, he's fairly damn tanky. Meanwhile, Puck has dove the tower and found a kill onto Juggernaut. Arise will come to clean up the Puck, realizing that the Undying's just a little bit too tricky to kill. And they do get the Puck in return. They lose the Jug and oh, just arise on the Magnus, unable to deal with the Undying. He got skewered back into range for his Soul Rip to heal him for more than he would have healed for <laughs> if he skewered him the other direction. Let him live a little bit longer maybe than he had expected and then just decided, yep, not worth using this. And he didn't even RP. That's the other thing, mm -hmm. is he just... Yeah. Just went for the skewer and I mean, even with the RP on the Undying, it... Uh, no, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have killed him. No. He knew that. Uh, yeah. So yeah. he just didn't have the mana to use all of his spells because yeah. he's going naked blink. So he only has 370 base mana pool or something like that. Gonna see a quick reconnect here, I'm sure, from Arise and That's everything... Very, very optimistic, man. Yes. Everything considered, <laughs> I'd say EE's Disciples are doing okay. Okay. If you compare the offlaners, the Puck and the Queen are doing about equal. Except Talara has Drought Aura, and he has two kills. So he is definitely edging out the offlaner from the side of basically unknown. And Puck's kind of mid-game impact can be massive against these types of teams where you're only going to have one hero that can really get out of coil. So you're going to have a Magnus, an AA, a Queen, and an Ogre, all of which can be coiled, which is very hard to deal with in of itself, because then you have to fight into Tombstone. That's the great thing about their lineup and the synergy that it has for the mid-game is if E's Disciples initiate properly, you will have to fight because you can't just break coil, try to run away from a tombstone with Undying chasing you down and Drow Aura, you got slow arrows and swaps and stuns. So they have a nice way of forcing engagements. It's just later on, you're going to run into BKBs and then it's going to be very difficult for the puck to force that fight. And that's yes. why it becomes very difficult for E's Disciples the later the game goes because BKBs nullify probably two to three heroes on their team completely. And then you're relying just on a Shadow Fiend and the draw right clicks to carry you up into being able to break high ground. So I still feel like the emphasis is on them. They need to make sure they get a lot for the next 10 to 15 minutes. And basically unknown, they still tied up the kills. It's still three to three. And their juggernaut, like you said, second highest farm. A uh, Magnus isn't really that far behind the Shadow Fiend because he started roaming. And Shadow Fiend is obviously just farming the woods whenever he's between waves. So it's expected that he's gonna pull ahead. It's looking balanced at the moment, but as you said, it's at a very, very tense point of the game. And in terms of the item pickups, you know, the Puck obviously deciding to finish off the treads, and unlike the Magnus, who was going yeah. for the naked blink, is there a reason why Puck just doesn't feel safe in going straight for that blink dagger pickup? Because is it not pretty key, the timing, for that Puck's blink in terms of taking control of the game? 
I feel when you're playing Puck with Drow, it's nice to have Treads just because of your overall damage output. And if yeah. you think of their style of lineup, what do they want to do? They want to siege, okay? So they walk up to a tower and they start hitting it. They force the fight because they're applying pressure to the tower. He doesn't necessarily need a blink if they're just going to be five manning after they get like their mech up or something like that because the blink money will come after they kill the tier ones for sure and yeah. if fights yeah. ensue off the back of that then you can drop your coil you can orb in and throw out a silence and you don't need that extra range not saying that blink is bad i just mean that because of the way that they're playing the lineup he might not need it early and the plus damage that you're going to get from drought or a plus treads means that your right click is actually fairly scary you know, I mean, he hits for 84 damage at seven minutes in, and he's going to have the Treads attack speed on top of that. And I'm still, yeah, the draw still isn't six. He's going to be one CS away. So the damage that he's going to get from Precision Aura is going to about double. And then he's going to start hitting for like over 100, which is pretty respectable for this early stage. Oh, it certainly is seven minutes in. I, I mean, talking about a time that we're saying, obviously, how strong Eve's lineup is at the early game. But at the same time, it's not going to get to a point you feel where basically Unknown's Draft just is you know, something that they can't deal with at all. I mean, in terms of high ground defense for EED. It will get to a stage where basically Unknown's Draft, if they start winning, like even one or two team fights, it's going to become very difficult for EED's Disciples to win because that's what they've drafted. They drafted an Undying and they've drafted a Puck, two heroes that are notorious for having this crazy early to mid game impact. And then they go high ground once and screw it up and then the game becomes unwinnable. That's pretty much what Envy says whenever you run a Drow lineup, is that if you don't break the base properly on the first attempt, the game becomes 10 times harder for you. And that's not even including the fact that basically Unknown have a triple core late game. You have Magnus, you have Jug, and you have Queen. So all of those heroes scale in some meaningful way. Juggernaut with Empower, terrifying late game. And there's no way a Drow is going to be able to outcarry that with the kind of backup that he has at his disposal. So unless this puck becomes some kind of farm god and just has like refresher agonim's hex or something crazy like that i i don't really see them doing too well if they they fail their high ground pushes okay and in terms of item picks of heroes like the drow there's obviously a lot of different ways you can build this hero yep. in terms of uh, how they've picked to this game do you think we're just going to see kind of the triple wraith bands coming out just for that early game agility Probably the best way to do it, yeah. I would say. Just, you want the most amount of damage output. I mean, you have your Venge and your Drow, and then you have your Shadow Fiend and your Puck. So there's only one melee hero, right? Because they needed somebody who could absorb damage. And the Undying, I feel, is a really good choice with the Puck. I love the synergy between the two. I think the Agi build is pretty much the only build, because the hero is really good at helping you win your lanes, and that usually transitions into getting Roshan and then getting all the outer tier towers down, which is very good against what basically I don't have for the early stage. It's just very fickle. If the team fights start going poorly for any reason, before they're even able to get full map control, I think basically Unknown would win the game just super easily. And on the topic of Ease Disciples having this early game power, is this going to mean that basically Unknown themselves are going to be pretty content in not looking to fight very early on and they're more going to kind of play a passive role, get the Juggernaut you know, safely into the jungle once he gets his mom and just look to farm him up before forcing engagements? You can AFK farm on the Jug forever. Yep. That's the great thing about having him power because you can just eat the jungle, you can go to the enemy side of the map. Juggernaut is pretty much ungankable with what EE's Disciples have, so he can play this as aggressive as he wants. He can go bottom, push out the wave, farm their woods, because unless that puck blinks on him with a silence or he gets like silenced by the drow from fog, he can just spin and TP. Like, what are they gonna do? The Venge can swap him if she's there, but she's not six. So if I was him, I would be feeling relatively confident in my capability to farm wherever I want. You can even call that playing greedy if you want to think that, uh, you know, just playing it ballsy and just farming whatever lane. But yeah, Arai is still having some connectivity issues, but hopefully they are all resolved shortly. I mean, in terms of the die, Undying as well, the, it was picked up fairly later on in, in the lineup for EASD. And you're talking about them wanting to hear a hero that was going to soak up a lot of damage. I, I do believe the Axe wasn't banned out. Is there a reason why you'd go for the Undying over the Axe in the situation and run kind of like an Axe Puck off lane? Would that just be a total kind of different picture that, that they wouldn't have wanted to do? The problem is both of those heroes need farm. Okay. That's why you can't pair them together because the Undying, he can just get like Arcane Boots or something like that and be fine because his survivability comes through his spell usage, whereas Axe wants a Vanguard. He wants 
wants a blink dagger, he wants tranquils. And the puck kind of needs the same item progression, like not necessarily a puck vanguard, but you know, he needs the money to be able to buy the blink. And if you're sharing between the two, it just means that your timing window for either hero is going to be later. And you don't want that. You want to try to dominate as soon as humanly possible when you're on these types of lineups. So I do think that Axe would have been nice to have, but they couldn't have laned it. Like no. the only reason this off lane is working at all is because the Undying is here. Like without him, they wouldn't have killed the Ogre. They wouldn't have killed the AA. And Talara would have been having a much, much harder time. And not only that, but because it's two heroes in the off lane, there's a lot of attention being focused here to make sure that Nico can continue to get his own farm. And that means that your Shadow Fiend's not going to get ganked, your safe lane's not going to get rotated on until Arise has a Blink Dagger. And it just makes the laning phase a lot less stressful for the side of E's Disciples, which is great for what their lineup is supposed to do. I mean, talking about the Axe not being able to replace the Undyne, what about the Axe instead of the Puck? In the sense that, I mean, Berserker's Call, it's kind of what a Waning Rift and a Dream Coil all rolled into one, albeit with a lot shorter range. And uh, we do obviously see the Axe a lot more than the Puck. Uh, what does the Puck offer other than, I guess, a lot of... Well, he's a little it's bit more... It's a ranged more... hero. Yeah. That's the that's only because reason. Because it's with the Drow strap. Exactly. Yeah. They wanted yeah. to put a ranged hero on every single lane. Yeah. Because they knew that they were going to be against double melees. So Juggernaut in the safe lane and Magnus mid. So with Drow Aura, it means that you're going to be able to find your CS. And people have a tendency to underestimate how hard you can actually right click yes. in the early stages when you have Drow Aura. And that just means easier lanes, easier snowball, strategy works better. Like everything is built around that aspect of what they want to do is we need to win our lanes, then we need to get all the towers, then we need to win the game. And with the drow, I'm kind of fishing for questions here, but we're trying to buy time. Drow, we always see nowadays, I kind of feel in that position one. Back in the day, you know, a little bit more in the mid lane. Is there a reason why we're seeing her less towards the mid lane position and more towards that position one? Because essentially, is she not a hero that really does... Rely if you get that level six early, your team is going to have a fantastic time in the lane. The problem with it is, is she's crazy gankable. She's very, very easy to kill. But, but compared to an SF as well, I mean, what? surely the SF is just as gankable. So the playstyle difference between the two heroes is that SF if the enemy team are going to rotate on him, he has a recovery method, right? He can raise the jungle, he can he can flash farm. That's okay. his strength. Yeah. Whereas Drow, you don't have the utility to be able to go and eat the jungle unless you go for lifesteal, for example. And that kind of leans away from the overall stacking agility strat, which is great for helping out your team. So it's kind of a, a conflict of interest is, we want to go mid because we want marksmanship quick. But if we go mid, we kind of have to build a bit differently to ensure that our lane goes well. And then that means we get less edgy, which means less help for the team. But we were there to help our team in the first place. You know, it, it's just like a, for me, it doesn't feel like the best choice. And again, drow teams from behind, they do not function. You cannot no, have no. deaths on drow in the early game. You need to be able to farm and you need to be able to get your core items up as soon as humanly possible. So Shadow Fiend is great because you can walk mid, you can double raise once you hit level seven, push the wave out super far, and then just go into the woods. That way, if the enemy team is going to gank you, they have a very short window from when they can see you on the map and when they can go in and say, okay, yeah, we can kill him now. Or if we have vision on the high ground, for example, in mid, which is pretty common for a lot of teams. There's even a ward there now. Um, but you're not really going to have the opportunity to do that to a Shadow Fiend as much as you would have a drop, for example. And it looks like we are going to load with somebody else because Arise is unable to reconnect to the game. That's a little bit unfortunate. I mean, Arise yep. on the Magnus was one of the reasons we saw the basically unknown being as uh, strong as they were the other day. So. Yeah, I hope they have a good stand-in. Yes. Because the Magnus play is very important for them. Like I mean, at least, uh, at least Arise has given the whoever's coming in a little bit of a good start. I mean, yeah. He's well on his way to the Blink Dagger. So he's kind of got over the first hurdle against, I guess, Laney against the Shadow Fiend, which, I mean, just, is that that hard as a Magnus? Or is nah, it's not, not really that, that hard. Is it? Because the way that Shadow Fiends tend to play is they, they just shove the wave and then they just go into the woods. So then you just farm under the tower, which is fine. Yeah. You know, you take a little bit of damage, but it's, it's not really a problem. Okay, so yeah, we are going to have a little bit of a break. I believe we can run some adverts. Should we run some adverts? I don't know. I mean, we're waiting on the we AA player. Around? It's not going to be that long. Yeah, we'll stick around. You know what? We already got everyone no in the lobby. No adverts for you guys. That's, that's how nice we are. We'll let you stick around. Yeah, so. we're just waiting for nukes to get the ready from both teams, and then we'll just we hop be right back, back in. in. Which I guess they can only load to on the minute. Was it? Were yeah, we even on the minute? on the minute. It says it was only seven seconds from the last save, so we didn't have to play a whole other minute. Okay, so... We paused at a seven second mark apparently after okay. the first minute, so we didn't really have much happen between that time. No, no. Yeah. I mean, we haven't had that much. Was it? I think it was 3 3 at the moment, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. It's so, only, what, eight, nine minutes in, something like that? 
It's pretty early game. Too. I can't even remember. I think it was seven like minutes, it was it? Ten years ago since last Dota. <laughs> Well, we're getting ourselves back in now. The loading screen is there, so bear with us. We'll be ready to get back into the game. Do we know they've got us the stand-in? Slavi. Slavi. Do we know who Slavi is? I don't is? know who that is. We don't know who Slavi is. Could just be an AKA. I, I honestly don't know. It could be the next best Magnus. It could be. He could Which be Arise's sure Disciple. Okay. It They're playing be. against EU's Disciples, but this is Arise's Disciple on Mag. Could he be the dream? Maybe. The go is cool, right, so we get ourselves back into the game. Look at that. Aren't we nice? We didn't play any adverts and we had a little break. What other kind of studios offer that amount of, uh, you know, compassion to the viewers? Here we go. Oh, Lord. <laughs> well, maybe we spoke a little bit too early. Game crash. Game okay. crash. That's good. I'd rather have the game crash than the internet crash. So yes. that hopefully means we're going to get in pretty quickly. That one is back to this screen. Hello. Again. So, Jurassic, how's your day? It's all right. Yeah. Did you get a good sleep last night? I did. You I did? slept more than I did the day before. Did you stream nice and late? Did you uh, annoy EGM with your shouting? No, no, no. See, the thing is, we got off. <laughs> Getting the nuts. We got off early yesterday, right? Because we only had we one did. series. So yeah. you started early. So I started, started early. early. I, I kept my yelling to a minimum. Yeah. But I did come in his room a few times and flame him while he was playing. Oh, were you playing. playing with him? No, 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 no. no. He oh, was you... playing FPL and I was just like streaming. So okay. I came in and I told him that he was awful, you know, the usual. And then I just left. But, um,. Apparently, I missed the Bone 7 feed game, which is unfortunate. I caught a bit of that. Funny. He raged, apparently. And EG, I don't think EG, EGM wasn't in that game, was he? No, he was on his team. Oh, you were on the team? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> EGM says he, he understands totally Bone mm. 7's uh, anger and uh, really emphasizes with the chat. So. I mean, I've tilted before when people have come to my lane and failed the gank, and then I die because of it. But have you ever DC'd from uh, one of the highest standard leagues in the no. Uh, game? No. no. I never did that. Rage quit. Not only did he rage quit, but he intentionally fed the other team damage and then rage quit. <laughs> uh, plus, what was it? Plus 14 damage at level 16? No, it's uh, 18. 18? 18, plus 18. 10, wow. 14, 18, yeah. Plus 18, but minus 25 for Bone Jam. Yeah, minus 17 for EGM. Rip MMR. So much for your 10,000 euros. EGM was up there as well. He was like this. He was top, top 10 top until 10? after that game. <laughs> The dream is dead. Wow, he's right, here not we go. Let's get ourselves back, back in, in game. the game. We can finally talk about the game. I think we did all right buying some time there, Draskal. Hope Decent. the stream, you guys at home are very entertained. If you're not entertained, please feel free to tune into other streams. But don't do that because you should stick around because we've got an exciting game here. East Disciples versus Basically Unknown. Where's the creep wave? This does happen when we load into the game. Who's not got a creep wave? Oh, no one's got a creep wave. Okay, but it's all right. Uh, because the creep wave momentum wasn't really in a key place anyway. There's no tier ones that have fallen yet, so it's not the end of the day. They they, they spawned now, annoying. so I guess yeah. that's okay. I think that's a just, little uh, awkward. Thanks, Volvo. This is something that will hopefully be fixed in Source Two, um, alongside a very a lot of other Keep stuff. Up. But here we go, back into the game, hitting the eight minute mark. Jug's got his Mask of Madness, he's into the jungle. He is third on the net worth for the moment. Uh, Shadow Fiend with uh, what I can only imagine, uh, him going into the jungle to clear up the stacks is of course well ahead, 4.1k gold on himself. Is that the completed mech flying out to him now? It's nearly the completed mech. He's got the buckler and the headdress, still needs to work on that recipe. And there goes Slavi. He knows what he's doing straight in there with the empower onto the Jug. And let's see what this Slavi Magnus can do. He's nearly got 1,900 gold. Let's hope that he doesn't die before he gets that blink. Blink is key here. There's not a tier one down yet, so if they get the timing, oh, bottom lane, a little bit of harassment going both ways. No deaths though, so we're oh, good. Top lane, there might be a death, pure evil. They go in deep Ow. and they go in hard as they realize that basically unknown have actually, yeah, well, they did rotate pretty much the rest of the team down to the bottom lane, left AA on his own. Maybe hoping that he finds some solo XP for his level six climb, but no, indeed. another kill for EZD, and yeah, Puck and Undying having a very, very pretty lane. And six Giant. is very important for this AA. Like, if he doesn't have six, no Ice Blast means that they can't really de-push that well. Like, if the Mag has Blink and AA is six by the time they start pushing tier ones, yeah. I would actually say that basically Unknown could win a team fight with ease as long as their AA Blast is on point. Now, if Arise is playing the Mag, I'd say, oh my god, sick five man RP is incoming. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know what to expect okay. from the stand-in, so... He's managed to get the blink, so that's yeah. the first hurdle over, and this is where we need to see Slavi come out Dyer's with the plays. And looking at how Arise was playing it the other day, it was pretty much at this point where he did kind of leave the lane, smoke up, and look to jump straight onto another core on the side of the, uh, the opponents. 
It's so important for the mag and the AA to have good games. The Juggernaut is only leaving the lane to make sure that Pure Evil can get solo EXP. The problem is it's being abused because every time he's there alone, he just gets ganked and then he dies. So he's not really achieving much with his solo lane here. And bottom, it looks like they want to try to apply some pressure to the tower. And I don't think there's really much that basically Anon want to do about this, at least for a little while. If they can just buy some more time, like a few more minutes, I think it will be a lot easier for them to fight. Yeah, and they've got this uh, Radiant Observer Ward here, which might just... Oh no, look at that, Magnus, he's just on the edge of it, and the ward not catching him. So, uh, perfectly sneaking around the Radiant Vision. He has got that RP Blink available, and whoa, here we go. Venge might be the uh, target of choice. Maybe not the best one to find with the RP, but it is going to be a kill if they can land it. Magnus getting ready to dive deep. Blink forward skewer. They don't even need the RP for this one. He throws out a magic missile, but Vengeful Spirit will die. Top lane again, though. AA dying to Talera and Teddy on this SF. And off the back of it, he is deep. They'll be able to get a tier one. They realize that they're just trying to get him sick, so they're just exploiting it, like I mentioned earlier. And they do lose the Venge. No pressure being dealt to the Tier 1 bottom, though. In fact, it's still at full health. And the first tower of the game, I think, actually going the way of E's Disciples. But we kind of expected that. Yes. There was no way that the draw lineup wasn't going to get a tower early into the game. And I really like the, the movement that they had shown there. And the Mag, not able to use his RP yet, but... He will be able to stack Ancients for his carry player because they do have Empower, which means that this Juggernaut is going to get very fat very quickly. I'm a little bit worried right now as Mind Control picks off the Drow solo here in the bottom lane. That Queen's level 9 and also has two kills to his name, so Mind Control is still performing very well. He's only like 15 CS behind the Drow. I would even say right now that E's Disciples are not doing enough. Like sure, they got their mech on their Shadow Fiend and Tolera, how close he is to Blink. He is only like 500 away. They're not doing enough. Like, th this is not good enough of an early game. Okay, mid lane, we see the Shadow Fiend back on his own. Pure Evil is about with the level 6 with the Ice Blast. And Magnus, of course, still with that RP available. Didn't need to use it on the bottom lane. Coming up to 12 minutes in the mid tier, one for the side of the Dire, fairly low. The push is also going to come in from the bottom lane with the ease. D, they've got four heroes grouped up, ready to apply the pressure to this tier 1 here. It uh, doesn't look like we're going to see any kind of defense coming out from the side of basically unknown for the time being. Aquab is going to make her Dyer's way back down there, picks up the rune attack. on the way. Yeah, Magnus is going to grab the top. They're going to let Radiance the Queen of Pain grab the bottom. Okay, see, so is going to scout this all out, knows Dyer's that the Queen of Pain and Ogre Magi are in the neighborhood. They have everything they need to fight this. They have all everything up. Here we go, Ice Blast is going to lead the way, will catch on to, oh, this could be big if you can find the RP, but the silence, perfectly done, blows up the Magnus before he can find the initiation that he was looking for, and great control there from EESD is going to mean that the counter push is going to be stopped, and they'll get the tower as well. That was a huge mistake TPing in that position, he should have TPed like all the way behind the tower. The gust range is very long, so... Like, the range is 900, which means that he was TPing in vision of a hero that can silence him, and the projectile can be out before your TP even lands. So if you do it properly, you don't even get to cast a spell. And he didn't realize that he got silenced because he still blinked forward. <laughs> so that was just a mechanical mistake by the Magnus player, and that hurts a lot, because that was supposed to be a nice fight, that they end up just getting a huge momentum shift and being able to stop them from snowballing, but instead, they lose their mag, and they get a tower deny, which is great. So well done by mind control. But that was supposed to be a team fight that they could have actually won. And instead, the AA Blast hits, and then the Magnus just kind of fails and dies. Not great. Nico Baby's going to be able to find the tier one here on the top side. Ah, big bad bird there with the deny. Very nice. He's done Tombstone. Gets thrown down. Nico Baby will just TP straight out of that one. Magnus smoked up, still without RP that he hasn't managed to find an initiation with. In a game where he did have the Blink Dagger over four minutes ago now, still hasn't really been able to do anything major with it. Found that kill onto the Vengeful Spirit on the bottom lane, but other than that, not a lot going the way of basically unknown. Obviously, with those towers pushed down, the gold difference is now there for EESD. Over 3k net worth advantage. And, I mean, oh, bottom lane, Mind Control pops out of the ult. McGraw there with the Gust trying to turn this one around. Has got the mask, uh, Morbid Mask giving a middle alive still and has got backup as well the oh. ice blast is going to blow him up though is on point they find the kill on the drow but uh not before they find the pick off onto mind control honestly that was still fine like trading a core for off lane the drow being dead the problem with e's disciples right now is oh well, i mean he's going for something here but i don't know if he's going to be able to kill solo he needs to wait for the AA blast to be up to even Doesn't try to need. go for this 
but their team composition is supposed to be owning right now and they're still getting picked off randomly even with the tier ones down i'm not that confident in ease disciples right now it only takes one or two good fights that's the problem for basically unknown to just secure the game so the mag only needs to perform like one good rp ice blast is back off cooldown Tolera could be in trouble so we can find the blink. Is he going to use it to stop the TP? Yes, he is. Oh, it's blast and shockwave. He will find the kill. He waits, but uh, he does manage to get it in the nick of time. And give me a heart attack. Nice kill there. <laughs> I was like, does he not see it? Radiant's bottom tower. Mid lane though, he's D. Applying the pressure. They've already cleared all the tier ones off the board. Now it looks like they're focusing on the tier two in the mid lane. They know there's no RP, so they know that this is the time to push. And uh, also, they, they're aware that Queen of Pain's ult is still down from when it was used on the dry at the bottom. And Queen of Pain actually blinking in. Okay, see, it turns around with the magic missile. There's only the Undying about. There won't be the control to hold Queen of Pain in place any longer. Roar and Teddy still focusing on pushing that wave down the middle. Bottom lane, we see Magnus getting a bit of damage onto the tower. He'll back off now as Teddy comes in. And uh, I mean, talking about the Drow Ranger, gone for the lifesteal, something that we don't always see Drows pick up at this stage. Do you think that's the best option for her? It's just a casual mass to make yeah. sure that she can jungle without losing health. It's a quality of life improvement, I would say, for this type of build, but he still wants to go for mainly agility items. And this queen is behind enemy lines Ooh. here. Hello, Mind Control tries to go in on McGraw. Doesn't have the ultimate, so the burst damage is not going to be there. Does get gusted up as well. STP's coming in as well. They really want to try and find this Queen. Tombstone was thrown down as well. Mind Control is going to get caught out in the jungle. There's your waning rift. Dream Coil as well. Wave of Terror with the right click from the puck being boosted by the Drow's agility bonus. Doing a fair bit of damage. Mind Control blinks away. Blink forward, though, from the puck, and they will be able to find the quad. And I guess space created, but uh, they do yeah, kill that, the Queen. Yeah, that really doesn't matter at <laughs> yeah. all. That's the problem. As these disciples TP to that, they are applying no pressure to any lane because every single one of their heroes is chasing a queen who's going for a solo kill. So that death is irrelevant. Like, sure, he gives away some some golden experience, but my control is still pretty farmed, level 10 in the off lane. He's not doing too badly. And more time that they delay, the easier it is for them to come back off of one good team fight, or maybe a Roshan, for example. And their juggernaut is still totally free farming right now. He's almost level 12. Almost keeping up pace with the Shadow Fiend, and he hasn't had him power for some time. No, he hasn't indeed, because Slavi, he's still been looking for action across the map. Has got the RP back off cooldown. Stuff of Wizardry working towards that four star. Slavi coming out quite a bit far here. Venge is nearby, does have that swap available. So Magnus needing to be kind of careful here with his. Uh initiation the puck is on the top lane at the moment though they don't have the puck for the team fight dream coil is still on off cooldown nico baby now with the empower heading to the ancients gonna get himself a nice jaw stack here has the sm1 on top of the boots and the mask of man is smoke up now from all five members of ease disciples they don't have the dream coil now they have the dream coil <laughs> they've got it already they're ready to go but at the same time basically unknown they've got all their ults online as well Radiant Ward that ESD has popped by the secret shop shows them that the Magnus has backed off, which means that they know that both the Ogre and the Queen of Pain Radiant's are pushing out on their own. Ice Blast will come through. We'll connect onto Lara. Oh, it stops his Blink Dagger. Oh, is, it might be working. I mean, he's going to try and TP out. They do have the Dream Card if they want to try and cancel oh, it, but Ogre's out God. of there. And at the same time, it's, they're both out of there. Queen of Pain gets herself out as well. So That all AA ult was the most unintentional god tier <laughs> play I've ever seen. If he had Blink, he would have caught both of them with Coil yeah. and they would both be dead right now. That was so lucky because there was a smoke. He didn't even know they were there. He just clipped them with the very edge of the AA blast. So free your evil. Literally team MVP without even knowing it. They're going to watch the replay and be like, you're a god. Like, that was insane. <laughs> very, very fortunate play there for the AA. Ease D back towards the mid lane. I mean, it seems at the moment they've not really been able to get the push on them. What, what are Ease D waiting for? They're waiting for basically Unknown to kind of fight into them, or are they just going to continue to make these smoke ganks and try and catch them? Oh, you need to keep trying to fight yeah. if you're Ease Disciples. It's not going to get any easier for you if the game goes later, because you're going to have to worry about an AA Agonims at some point. He's got 2,500 gold. He's level nine. He's living the dream right now. Because of the fact that mind control is always in their side of the map, just creating problems, forcing them to TP react, means that this AA gets a free lane. That doesn't sound like a huge deal, but going from level one to level two Ice Blast is pretty damn big. And then if he gets Aghanims on top of that, pushing is gonna be so hard if you're EE's Disciples. And that's all their lineup is supposed to do is push. You push, you push, you push, you kill Rosha and you push more. And then you hopefully win the game. If you don't, you're going to have to fight into one of the hardest high ground teams, I think, that uh, 
that they can put together right now. I mean, they don't have any huge AoE control, but just between Ice Blast, having wave spam, and trying to push into that mass AoE, it's very difficult. Um, big guiding items are coming out for Easty. We've got Teddy now finishing off the Skydy on top of the mech treads. 19 and a half minutes in. It's not a bad timing at all for the SF. And we saw him farm very well the other day when we watched uh, old Teddy on the SF. And he's certainly doing it again. 11k net worth before the 20 minute mark. Very nice indeed. But kind of expected with the amount of structures they've been able to take for them. Lane, Nico Baby coming in with a Mask of Madness. Focusing on the objectives. Goes for the tower. Fortification will come out. Ice Blast being thrown down just in case anyone was going to TP in from ESD, but Radiant's looks like they're going to let this one down. LT. He almost saw McGraw there as well, but it was nighttime, so Nico was like a 100 or 200 range out of vision. And he had Mask of Madness on. There was no way that Drow would have lived if he had seen him, so that was pretty fortunate. And with that tier 1 down, they can honestly go for Roche if they really want to. They probably wouldn't lose much health on their Jug anyway. He still has his Quelling. He's got level four in power, so, or no, level three in power. Okay, so yeah, he can just kill it, no big deal. I honestly think that E as Disciples are just gonna start having a really hard time in this game. They have not, like, forced their advantage at all. Wave of Terror will scout out the Roche attempt, but it just doesn't look like E's D are in a position to try and contest this one. They're gonna have to let this one go to the side of basically unknown. Top lane, they're trying to get a little bit of a push on themselves with the uh, Shadow Fiend and the Undying. It's only the AA holding ground there. Has AA spent some of that gold now? Let's have a look. He did have a huge amount stocked hard on him. Now, yeah, so now he's started to pick up the items. He's only a point booster short of the Aghanim Scepter 21 minutes in. And this is an AA that has died three times as well in the early laning stages. That's why you have to be so worried. The way that basically Unknown are using the map is just much more effective than what EE's Disciples are doing. They're getting pulled apart. They're getting deterred from their ultimate game strategy, which is just try to end the game as fast as humanly possible. And their timing window is growing shorter and shorter. They're not going to have much more opportunities to take engagements. And now, just getting Roshan, how big of an impact that has, it says, okay, we cannot fight for the next few minutes, at least, if we don't want to just get completely crushed. And because they're still doing very well on the net worth, like they had a little bit of a gold lead, but if you fight and you're on even terms against Aegis, with a lineup that's supposed to be able to go high ground, and then you lose as top lane. Ah, oh, yes, very nice gang. indeed. They hang around in the trees, the three of them get ready to jump in. Picking off the AA, slowing down that progression towards the point booster and ultimately into the Aghanim Scepter. Very nice indeed. And I mean, we're talking about the power of the team fight of basically unknown. Is there just not a point where Shadow Fiend will be so tanked up that they won't be able to blow him up, or do you they'll think they'll always, always be able, be able to? Kill him. They yeah. will always be able to kill that hero. Because of the way that Juggernaut works with Empower, if you get one RP, it doesn't matter how many heroes are in it because of Empower with a Juggernaut and Omni Slash and a Queen on top of that. Yeah. And the Shadow Fiend not having BKB, you will die. There is no living. It's just very reliant now on being able to outplay in teamfights. That's what EE Disciples have to rely on. You either get a good smoke gank and you try to base off that, or you outplay your enemy. It's bottom bottom lane. lane. Yeah, mind control leading him with the ultimate. And we'll blink forward and a few punches to the face. Dagger into the eyes of the Vengeful Spirit. Another kill here for mind control, who has now got that Aghanim Scepter completed for the Quop. As well, Juggernaut in the mid lane, chasing down the SF in the trees. SF and Puck. Both have the ultimates. They've got Dream Coil and the Requiem, but straight away they go straight in, and there we go with the RP after the Omni Slash. Beautifully done. The two heroes in the sidelines getting caught out and that brought together. That was without Empower, by the way. Oh, Nico wow. didn't get it until <laughs> after the entire engagement. And it didn't ended. matter at this point, did it? it was just and you asked if they much. could kill the Shadow Fiend? Yes. They can kill the Shadow Fiend. <laughs> there is your answer, indeed. And now with these heroes down, it's time for basically them then to do a little bit of pushing of their own. They've got the healing ward in the middle lane without the Shadow Fiend and the Puck. This is going to be pretty much impossible for EESD to jump into as the tier two will indeed go down. Ultimate Orb and Point Booster for the uh, jump. Yes, yeah, so he has, he's got the Scardi complete as well by the looks of it. And are you so going for the Scardi over the Manta this game? Is that is that what he needed to do? On the Jug, yeah. 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 You don't really need Manta against no. any of their heroes. You can Manta Silence, I guess, but I don't think he's that concerned about getting silenced or even dying at this point. It's going to be very difficult for E's Disciples to come back from this. Like, they're, they're the ones who are supposed to be making those types of plays happen, and they're on the receiving end of a couple of beatings off of just getting Roshan taken away from them. They lose their tier 2 mid, they lose their core, their Shadow Fiend, and a, another kill as well. I think it was on Tolera. Yeah. But the, uh, the dream is almost dead right now for E's Disciples. Their lineup is so reliant on being able to snowball, and they're not doing it. So 
your Shadow Fiend, sure, he's farmed, but the Juggernaut is now more farmed than the Shadow Fiend. And before, we were worrying about if the Magnus could line up his RP, because the first few defenses are crucial against this kind of lineup, because if E's Disciples just ran over them, then suddenly they would have such a, an advantage in terms of farm and DPS that they would be able to fight into high ground. But now, a team that's supposed to play from ahead is behind mm -hmm. against a team who already had better late game. So now it's like, well, unless you get some serious sick plays going, you are in some big trouble. I mean, some of these heroes on the side of Unknown are just uh, beginning to look very, very scary. Pure evil. Yeah, he's only 400 gold off his Aghanim Scepter. Ogre has 2.2k gold in the bank if he wants to start working towards his as well. So I don't know. It's a lot of money coming out and some key heroes on the side are basically unknown. And they do have that jug, as we were saying, on the top of the net worth coming on top of the Shadow Fiend, who's sitting about 3,000 gold behind. I mean, the puck working towards the old Aghanims. Uh, will the Aghanim Scepter Dream Coil change a lot in these team fights? It will help. Yeah. Aghanim's coil is extremely powerful, four and a half seconds stun on breaking the tether, and it keeps you in place for a very long time, so it can be a deterrent to pushing high ground. It's just that the inevitability factor of a farm juggernaut, a queen, an AA with Aghanims, and a Magnus is much worse than a Shadow Fiend and a Drow, because the puck, even with Aghanim's coil, if they're hitting your tier three towers and you don't have the damage to kill them, then it's just, it's too much, and they're gonna get another pick off on this AA but they're killing probably the least valuable hero. That's all they're able to do. And getting this tower will be nice for them if basically unknown decide not to engage, which without AA, I would imagine. Uh, maybe they still want to They're looking for the RP. They're going to skewer the Shadow Fiend back, see if he can find anyone else, but he won't. It will just be the SF, but it doesn't matter because Juggernaut coming in with the damage blows up Shadow Fiend and I will be able to TP out. They won't have any ways to stop that. They blow the RP and they go in with the Jug. They get a kill on the SF, but they do defend the Tier 2. They'll be able to deny it, and they did, of course, take the Tier 2 from the side of ESD on the bottom lane as well. Oh, boy. Easy Disciples. I mean, this kind of lineup was very all-in-ish. It's either we go ham or we just lose. And I'm thinking right now it's just going to be the latter. But basically, no one played it perfectly. They, yeah. Like, mind control for me has been kind of a standout because he knew that even going for his YOLO plays, that was almost a necessary evil for their team to make sure that the game was delayed long enough for their core heroes to have what they needed. So they had that blink RP, they had the AA getting that ultimate up to be able to deep push. And then the Juggernaut just farms with Empower all over the map, still ahead of a Shadow Fiend on CS, which is not very common that you see that because Shadow Fiend is notorious for being one of the faster farmers in the game in general. So mind control for me has just been uh, pretty spectacular. And yeah, Nico Baby looking very scary now with the Basher and the Blink Dagger picked up on top of his Scardi. 27 and a half minutes. And if we have a look at the overall net worth, in fact, between the two teams, how much of a swing are we seeing? I, it's a little bit. I mean, we're 27 minutes in, 5,000. It's not the biggest, but it's certainly one that Unknown have created and they are maintaining. And uh, that is after, you know, at, at least Eased, he got a very early significant tower advantage against the side. But it certainly feels like their lineup and draft is falling off as we're kind of getting to the latter stages of the game. Now AA with the Aghanim Scepter complete. It's, uh, I mean, what is the plan here for Eternal End? Stops at bottom lane, McGraw, he gets blown up by Quop. Tolera coming in, trying to find some return aggression, pops the Dream Call down for this as well. Mind Control, he will blink out, but the Magic Missile also will get disjointed. The Earnest Shadow ticking him down and he will die. They will finally kill on the Quop, but again, it's your offlaner for your position one end. Well, here we go. Basically, unknown, they're going to look for more. They've got the RP, they've got the Omni Slash. Ice Blast coming through, will scout out OKC in the tree line, but he will be able to TP away. Slavi's going to find Undying Blink forward before the tombstone zombie damage kicks in finds him in the tree line there we go with the skewer with the right click from nico baby absolutely disgusting two heroes down on esd basically unknown only losing the off lane quap and what do esd do now at this point is there anything that they can do or hope for that will get them back in the game the timing of that gank couldn't have been any worse for them because now roshan could be spawning soon and they won't be in position to defend so if it's a short roshan then okay it's not there we go, a minute and 40 seconds. But still, they need to fight around Roche and they need to hope that they have some kind of a miracle because that's the only way they will make their way back into the game. If I'm being frank, I think they have like almost a 0% chance of winning okay. at this point. Like it, it kind of sucks because they haven't even lost all their tier twos yet, but their lineup just works this way is that they don't have a plan B. There's no comeback mechanic for them. It's just 
We needed to win our lanes and then push really hard. Oh boy, Venge. And a little bit deep there in enemy territory. He's going to walk into an AA and an Ogre. They're getting the slows off. Ice Blast will fly through as well. Will catch on to OKC. And with the Agnims, Ice Blast should be very dead, especially with the Shockwave on his head. They do find the return kill on the AA as Puck goes in, but the Ding Ding Ding's coming through. Basically unknown. Picking off again two heroes and only losing one. This time getting the Puck and the Venge in exchange for the AA. And we're seeing the XP swings become bigger and bigger. A difference of about 1.6 and the gold flying through as well. 15 to 12, basically unknown. It, I mean, we were talking earlier about how these teams maybe come in against these more experienced teams and play for the early game. Once it gets to the late game, they do begin to struggle because one mistake can kind of cost it. It feels like EE's Disciples, they're making quite a few mistakes now. McGraw on the top lane could be in trouble also. Nico Baby trying to juke out the gust, and he will do indeed. Great positioning there from the jug. And McGraw, he's in the trees, but the trees aren't going to save him this time. The multicast come through the crit from Nico Baby. It's, it's falling apart very easy. The problem is, even if you made mistakes on a late game oriented team, you can still recover because of your either team fight potential or your core is really fat and you can just fight because of that. But this draws items. Like, he is not farmed. He has less, or well, he has half the CS, not the Juggernaut. Oh, and, okay, goodbye. Mind control. <laughs> Perfect. Control. With, with the range of that ultimate, he knew exactly. He, he got him with the tip there. Yeah, but th this is what I was saying is look at Nico Baby's farm. Abyssal, SNY, Scotty, Blink, Mask of Madness. You compare that to what Dro has, Mask of Madness, Blink, Yasha. I like this. They're going for the Roche. It's it's a ballsy attempt, but they might get away with it because uh, basically they're fairly far away. They are heading over to that it, yeah. map, but I mean, shit with the Aegis in the next fight, could, do you think that might help them just enough or? I don't even know if that's enough to, to actually win a fight. They will get out, though, for free, which is nice. Although they might Talera. get their puck out. He doesn't have Orchid or anything, so I don't think Mind Control can actually get a kill here. Talar is just going to orb away. There's an Ice Blast coming in, though. Oh, is the Ice Blast going to be off. on point? It's a little bit... Oh, Talera gets so low there to the ultimate Sonic Wave. But he will get out. Now with the puck low and having to go back to base, maybe this is the time that basically Loon looked to push. They would be pushing into an Aegis. A uh, bit of damage coming out now for the old Shadow Fiend. He's managed to get himself a Daedalus out onto the game it's on top choice. of the Scardi. So, I mean, he's going to be punching with that Drow Aura as well. He needed to go a damage item. There's no way you can go the standard Shadow Fiend, which is like mech Scotty into another defensive item, like either BKB or Butterfly, because you wouldn't be able to kill anybody on Basically Unknown. They needed a heavy damage dealer to kill the Jug. Yes. This is probably one of the only item choices he could have gone for, and I fully agree with the choice. If he can get some good damage uptime without getting just RP'd or Omnied, I think it can be a, a little bit of a fight. I mean, looking at the Drow's build, we were talking about prioritizing the Agi items. She's got three items, the Blink, the Mask of Madness, and the Shadow Blade that don't offer anything in that manner. Do you feel this is a bit of a, a strange build from McGraw in terms of what the kind of team brings as a whole? She needed to build items that let her position better because yeah. their lineup wasn't played the way that it, I feel it should have been, which is just continually apply pressure everywhere. And they realized that after a while that their lineup wasn't working the way that they had intended. Okay. So I think that he just revised his item build to make sure that he could not just instantly die if he was trying to split push or if he gets caught by an RP or something like that because just him being alive is big damage. Ultimate flash through, only going to catch Teddy out. They do have the RP though. Basically, you know, looking to find the positioning. They will lose the tier two here. Here comes Juggernaut from the sidelines. The D, they're holding their position, keeping the pressure on. They do still, of course, have that Aegis available. Magnus playing around with the RP button. Be careful, Sunny Jim. You don't want to pop that now. 12 to 17. Now the entire team of EASD, they're in the dire jungle. There is no dire vision here. Dream Call was actually popped down for, uh, for, uh, well, right there. Mi mi mis maybe he is using quick cast? M maybe. Um, That's the only time I can yeah. ever see you accidentally <laughs> doing a coil in the middle of nowhere, is you have to be using quick cast. Here we go. Smoke up now from the side of basically unknown. Let's see if they can execute their ultimate set. A little bit better. Straight down the mid lane at the moment. In the mid lane, there's the SF on his own Teddy. Oh, God. No. Oh, Teddy, this is please. Bad. 
Oh, Teddy, in comes the blink from Mind Control. Teddy trying to get the Red Grim off, but in comes the Abyssal Blade. That is your Shadow Fiend down. Round one complete. Now they're going to go for round two. Ice Pass will fly through, catches McGraw, and Teddy as he comes back on the slash Sonic Wave to the face. That is your Shadow Fiend down to Lara, looking to join out with the Illusory Orb. We'll be able to do it. Big Bad Bird has got a double damage, but he's just going to be able to stand there and watch as OKC okay, uh, with the Bash is free. The Blink Fury as he comes in with the right clicks. He'll go down as well. Killing spree now for the Magnus. Two heroes down. They're going to look for more. They don't have anything to cancel the TP from Big Bad Bird. He will be able to get out. But still, two heroes down. GG is called. Hats off to easy because I think this is. It, they they can't win. They yeah. knew that they had no way of winning. Yeah. Their lineup was a very all in strategy. I think that it's a good idea, but they didn't do it well enough. Like, the, the problem with those lineups is if your game plan deviates even a tiny bit yeah. and you start to run into some issues pushing high ground, your lineup doesn't have any way of coming back into the game. You don't have your Juggernaut with Empower and Mass Farm. You don't have your Magnus late game RPs that can just instantly bring you back into the game. You have a bunch of ranged heroes who were supposed to dominate the lane, and they did do the do okay in the laning phase. I'd say mm -hmm. they did well enough to be able to snowball, but their mid-game decision-making, and even after they get that really lucky blink when the Mag thought he had RP, but he was silenced, and they get that kill, they get two quick towers. I was like, okay, you know, this is going fairly well. And then the next couple of engagements didn't go well at all. Not and so. then they lost Roshan, and then it's like, well, now your lineup just doesn't do anything, so. It's rough. I mean, the strat that they kind of went for, it's something that you're kind of safe to try out in a best of three series. You know, it there's requires, no reason not to give it a go. It oh. requires high level execution, though. Yes. That's the thing. Like, you cannot make mistakes with those kinds of lineups. So, Not at all, but I doubt they're going to try it again. I'd be very surprised if they come in with a draft like that in game yeah, two. They'll I don't just, think so either. No, they'll go back to basics. Maybe we'll see kind of the Medusa, Shadow Fiend more farm orientated. Maybe try for the late game. The early game push didn't work out for them. Maybe try and step up to the late game, which is, of course is going to be very hard against the side of Basically Unknown. And uh, you know, special mention to the Magnus Standin, who did perform to a pretty nice level. There weren't game-changing RPs, but he certainly found a fairly few nice pickoffs, and yeah. the threat was always there at the Magnus RP, which sometimes is all you need. And uh, that is it for game one. Game one, of course, going to Basically Unknown. It is a best of three. We'll see you back for game two very, very shortly. But first of all, to a few commercials and then back over to our panel. We'll see you guys in a bit.